right, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here, and uh, my name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs Church, and I'm delighted whether you're here for the first time or you're here as a, uh, as a regular attender, part of our church family. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here today, and I believe that really God has a, a special word for us today as we continue the series. I'm calling God with us. Would you say that with me? God with us. Last week, we talked a little bit about uh, how God is with us. That's what the name Emmanuel means. And we talked a little bit about how God is with us in the valley. What I want to do is kind of shift a little bit and talk to you specifically about how God is with us in what we call a wilderness. Okay? Everybody say, God is with me, even in the wilderness. And I want to start with a uh, verse that we started with last week, but it's uh, Matthew quoting from the prophet Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, where he says this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. He said, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him, what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. And last week we talked about how we may enjoy God in our relationship with Him on the mountaintops. Like when things are going great and things are wonderful. We enjoy God in those powerful experiences and those wonderful times. But on the other hand, when times are tough, when times are a little challenging and we're going through the difficult struggles sometimes, that, those are really the moments where we get to know God intimately. We get to know more about his character. We get to know more about his love for each one of us. And we get to know, really, that God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. He will never turn his back on us and leave us all alone. And when do we find that out, really? When we're going through stuff. Has anybody ever gone through stuff? <laughs> okay. Now, that's a, that's a question that uh, everybody says yes to. I mean, the wilderness experiences, valley experiences, challenges, troubles, hardships, they're inevitable. We all go through them. But that's why it's so important. And I felt the burden of the Holy Spirit just to minister on these things these, these last two weeks because I believe that God wants to encourage many of us. And God wants to comfort many of us. To know that he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, he'll never abandon us, but that we can know and be sure that he's always with us, especially in the difficult moments of life. Now, the wilderness is different from the valley because the wilderness can sometimes last much longer, okay? I want you to think about this. Uh, the wilderness can be a, a barren place, a dry place, an empty place, a desolate place where you can feel very alone. You can feel kind of disoriented. You can feel lost and confused and inadequate and just like out of control. These are the feelings that can happen when you're going through a wilderness experience. And I put these up on the screen. These are some kind of key words to help us think about what a wilderness experience is. Jot these down if you're taking notes with me. Trials. Testing. Hardship. Uncertainty. Wandering. And even wondering. These are experiences, these are things that we all face and all throughout the Bible as people have gone through regular seasons of the wilderness, they've faced these kinds of feelings and experiences. I, I, I love the outdoors. I love the outdoors. I love to go to like national parks and visit places and just enjoy God's creation and this past year. Uh, Ashley and I celebrated a, an anniversary. I can't remember which number it is, but she's not here in the room, so don't tell her. I can't remember. But it's like 17 or 18 years of uh, marital bliss. And so we took a trip to uh, Glacier National Park up in northern Montana. And we went up there and just did some hiking, did some walking around. And uh, I have a picture of the, uh, we were up there just enjoying God's wonderful creation. Now talk about wilderness. That was wilderness. Like no one was 
around, there are wild animals there. In fact, there, is a, uh, there were signs posted all around of, uh, like, watch out for the grizzly bears. Okay, they were like, warning, you need grizzly bear spray because you are in the backcountry wilderness right now. And listen, <clears throat> they sell bear spray at the airport. And Ashley's like, oh my goodness, we're, we need some bear spray. And I'm all stubborn and stuff and say, no, we can tough it out. There's no bears going to bother us. And she's like, Brian, they're selling it at the airport. Like, as soon as you leave the airport, you are in danger. <laughs> like, no, no, no. We don't need any bear spray. So anyway, we went, we went hiking several, several times in this backcountry wilderness. And talk, talk about trials. Talk about testing. Talk about hardships in your marriage, right? Uh, we had some wonderful experiences. I even took a little video clip. I want to show it to you now. Turn it up. She's singing. She's singing. Hey, babe. Huh? What are you scared of? I'm scared of bears. I have no bear spray. It says we're in bear country. There are, we have no bear spray and there's warnings everywhere. So we survived the first part of this hike. Now we gotta go back through it and I'm gonna be yelling so no bears will be surprised by me. Onward. Bear! I'm coming! I'm coming, Bear! Don't be afraid! Now, talk about the wilderness experience, right? <clears throat> I want you to just think about that for a minute because that was a trial for our marriage. Amen? That was a test of our love and our patience for one another, that whole trip. Okay? Uh, we, were, we experienced hardships of, of all kinds uh, during that time. We were uncertain if, if we were going to survive, right? Or if our marriage was going to last. Because how many of you have heated discussions in your relationships sometimes? Okay, so that experience for us uh, spurred a lot of good, passionate conversations within the marital context, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, and so we were, we were doing some wandering around in backcountry, bear country, and we were one wondering if we were going to make it. <laughs> Some of you right now may not be in a literal wilderness, but you're in a spiritual one. Or maybe you're here today and you're in a relational wilderness, and, and maybe you're in a financial wilderness. Maybe it's a wilderness in your work life, your, your family life, whatever situation you may find yourself in, maybe today you would be like, yeah, I can kind of relate to that wilderness season because let me tell you this, when you're in a wilderness season, like you know it, you know you're there because the feelings are there, you're experiencing loneliness, frustration, God's doing a deep work in you that you, you perhaps cannot uh, figure out what is God doing in me? And you try to explain it to people, like, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, God is working in me, but nobody can really grasp it, the reality of what you're experiencing. But when you go through times like that, when you go through a wilderness season, here's what's important to remember. And I put this up on the screen, and I want you to jot it down if you're taking notes with me. If you're not taking notes, jot this down anyway, okay? You're going to need it. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend upon God. I want to tell you a story about Elijah in the Old Testament. He was a prophet. 
And a prophet just means that God used him in massive ways. God spoke to him and he relayed God's word to the people around him. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see the prophet Elijah. And he was used of God in all kinds of just massive, incredible, miraculous ways. He's literally on, has mountaintop experiences, right? And on the top of Mount Carmel, he stands up these false prophets. He calls down fire from heaven. And he experiences the manifest glory and presence of God. And almost immediately... After that mountaintop experience, we see him going from the mountaintop to the wilderness. How many of you know this, that wilderness seasons often follow mountaintop experiences? This is exactly what Elijah was going through because he became in a place where he, in his life where he was just desperate. He was depressed. He feels all alone, and he's running scared. The prophet of God, the man of God who experienced all of these wonderful interventions of God now finds himself in a deep, dark wilderness experience. There was an evil king named King Ahab. Ahab had an even more evil wife. You remember her name? Her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel heard all about what Elijah had done. And how God had used, uh, used Elijah in, in just marvelous ways. So she got mad and essentially said to her husband, Look, if you can't do the job, then I'm going to do it for you. And she says, and she sends, she sends word to the prophet Elijah and says, By this time tomorrow, Elijah, you will be dead. She threatened him. She threatened his very life. And just as a side note, King Ahab, this evil king, had been coming after and pursuing Elijah for years and years and years. But as soon as a woman got mad, Elijah got scared. (laughs) I'm just making an observation there. (laughs) 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 3. It says this, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Just pause there just for a second. Now to run to Beersheba from where he was, listen, this was before Uber. This was before Lyft. This was before taxis. This was before public transportation, okay? Elijah had he ran a hundred miles. I looked that up on the map just to see like how far he ran. Man, this guy was scared. I mean, he turned into Forrest Gump and he was just like, I am going to run. I'm running. (laughs) And he runs a hundred miles to get away from this angry, crazy woman. Verse 4. He says, while he himself went a day's journey into the, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Okay, he was on the mountaintop experiencing God's power. He got afraid and he took off running away and he ran right into the wilderness. Continues and says, he came to a broom bush. He sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die, the great man of God. And he says, I have had enough, Lord. I've had enough. Take my life. I wish I was dead. I'm no better than my ancestors. And I thought about that and how many times, how many of us have come to that point in life where you just said said those very words like, I'm done with this. I can't handle any more of this. I'm spent. I've had enough. I cannot take it 
anymore. I think of parents raising their children, right? Any, anybody raising a teenager or you've been through that, you got the t-shirt, you know how hard and how difficult that can be. And at some point you just had it up to here and you've said, Lord, I've had enough. <laughs> and you have those moments where you say as a parent, don't make me come back there. I can reach you from here, you know, and you're doing this thing. I've had enough, Lord. I can't take it anymore. Some of you are in a, they have a work situation going on where, where the straw just breaks the camel's back, and you're just like, I can't take it here anymore. I just can't take another day in this crazy wilderness place that I'm in. Some of us are here, and, and it's, our wilderness is financial. And we're just like, oh, my goodness, I cannot get ahead. No matter what happens, no matter how hard I try, no matter how many hours I put in, I just cannot seem to make ends meet. There's always more month at the end of the money. And I've had enough, Lord. I just can't do it anymore. You feel like you're making some progress, and then the car breaks, and then the toilet overflows, and then your two-year-old gets a tic-tac stuck up, stuck up his nose, or whatever the situation is, and you're like, God, I cannot handle it anymore. It, what is that? It's a wilderness experience. You feel overwhelmed, and often it's those small things, just one right after the other, and just that straw, that... That breaks the camel's back. And you work hard. And you serve faithfully. And I think about uh, my my wife. Like she works hard really making the uh, family dinner. Like you spend like an hour, hour and a half, two hours like preparing the best meal ever. And then it's served on the table and we gobble it up in 30 seconds. And we leave and we don't clean anything up. And she's like... What just happened? I cannot take this anymore. I'm going to turn into Jezebel if you guys don't get in here and clean up your dishes and say thank you for the wonderful meal that I took time to prepare for you. Wilderness experience. Frustration. Anger. Loneliness. Feeling out of sorts. This is apparently what happened to the prophet Elijah. Because this guy had experienced the manifest glory and presence of God. This guy had fought with bravery, with boldness, with with just every part of his being. He stood down an evil king. He experienced God's miraculous provision and protection. He raises a boy from the dead. He calls down 850 prophets of Baal. On the mountaintop, he calls down fire and so on and so forth. But now he's running scared for his life. Fear has entered into his heart. And some of you feel this way right now. You're just like, I'm had enough. I can't take this anymore. I don't know what to do next. I'm frustrated. I'm doing the best that I can. But my best never seems to be good enough. I'm tired. I'm just tired. Now, in Tennessee, we say it like, I'm tired, like T-A-R-D, I'm I'm tired, okay, I'm worn out, I'm tired. I read a, I I like to listen to podcasts from time to time about leadership and ministry, and I was listening to one this week with um, a guy by the name of Dr. Henry Cloud, wonderful Christian counselor, minister. And he was having a conversation with a bunch of ministers who were expressing that they were tired, that they were ministry. They're, they're just like, this is hard work. It's demanding. I can't seem to do anything right. My church isn't growing. My people aren't doing what I want them to do. Like, it's just discouraging. And, and, and they're saying, I'm tired. But Dr. Cloud says in that conversation, he said, maybe... You need to think about this differently. Maybe you're misdiagnosing your challenge. 
And he looked them all in the, in the eyes and he, and he said this. I want you to consider that you may be misdiagnosing what your real need is. Dr. Cloud said, most of you are not tired because if you were tired, then a nap would solve your problem. He goes on to say, you're, you're not as much need as in, in, in need of physical rest as much as you are in need of spiritual replenishment. And he said this, you're not just tired, guys. I want you to think about this. You are spiritually depleted. You're not just worn out by all the things that are going on. No, you're dry, you're empty, you got holes in your spiritual bucket. And it's leaving out more than it's coming in. You're just spiritually depleted and empty. And I've been praying for this service today because I believe there's somebody here that just needs to hear this this morning. Maybe it's not that you're tired. Maybe it's not so much that you're overwhelmed. What you may really need is a genuine, powerful encounter with the living God. Maybe what you really need is an intimate moment where you experience fresh grace. Maybe what you really need is is just a revelation of the goodness of God in your life once again. You've forgotten that he is with you and that he is for you and not against you. You've forgotten how good he really is. Maybe you're not just tired, but maybe you do need some physical rest. But maybe some physical rest would actually do you some good. But even more than physical rest, we need to encounter the grace of God. We need a spiritual replenishment. We need to understand what it says in Psalm 23. Where David is talking about his shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Look at what the Lord does. He makes me. Some of us need to be made to lie down in green pastures. He leads me. Do you need direction this morning? He can lead you. He will lead you beside the still waters. And pay attention to this part, this part right here. He restores my soul. Boy, maybe it's not that I'm just tired. Maybe I need some soul restoration. Maybe I need the presence of God. Maybe I need a, t- a dose of grace and his presence in my life. So what does God do with Elijah? Well, I love what God doesn't do with Elijah. He doesn't preach him a sermon. It doesn't lay blame on him. He doesn't say, here's ten verses, go memorize them. He doesn't say, where is your faith? Oh, great man of God. What does God tell him? God tells him to go eat. And go take a nap. Look, look, look at this. 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once the angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. Sounds tasty, huh? He ate, he drank, and then he laid down again. If you listen to God, sometimes he may tell you to go get a cheeseburger. (laughs) Go get some Chinese food. Get up and eat. He looked all around, and there by his head there was some bread. I'm sure it was gluten-free. <clears throat> Baked over the hot coals, there's this jar of refreshing water. He ate, he drank, and he laid down again. 
What, what did God say, essentially, to the prophet right here? He says, sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is to rest in the presence of God. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to take a breather and let God restore your soul. Look at it in in, uh, verse 7. It says this, The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 9. There he went into a cave, and he spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Some of you, God may speak to you that way and ask you questions like, What do you think you're doing? You know better than this. You're running away from me, and you're running away from other people. What are you doing? And then Elijah starts getting what I call the whiny voice. Okay, has anybody ever whined to God? (laughs) Okay, am I the only one? Okay. So Elijah, this man of God, now given food, drink, and a nap, he begins to whine a little bit. And he says this in uh, verse 10. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. That wasn't true, by the way. But he said, I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Reminds me of that part in Shrek where Donkey is like, I'm all alone. (laughs) There's no one here (laughs) beside me, right? (laughs) Elijah gets that whiny tone in his voice, and he's in the middle of this wilderness. Listen, the prophet is hurting. The prophet is scared. His need is so great and so big right in front of him, he cannot see anything else beyond what he's going through. He feels like nobody understands. He feels like he's doing it all alone. He's desperate, and he's like, God, help me. What do I do? And I, and I love this part. Don't miss this. This is so good. God meets him right where he is. God meets him in his deepest need. God is going to minister to him in his moment of vulnerability. God brings healing in the middle of his hurt. This is what our God does. And again, your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Verse 11, let's see what happens. The Lord said, go out and stand on, this, on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12. Don't miss this. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. A gentle whisper. From the Lord himself. You see, God was not in the big and the remarkable. He was in the lowly, the gentle, and the ordinary. Sometimes we miss what God is saying to us 
Because we're expecting a thundering voice. We're expecting a miraculous happening of some kind. And we miss his still, small voice. God came to Elijah in the gentle whisper. Why is it that when life gets hard and we go through valleys and wildernesses, that God's voice seems so quiet? Why is he so gentle? Why is his voice so still and so small? Why doesn't he speak loud and in powerful ways? If he wants us to know him and he wants us to hear him, then why does he whisper? I'll tell you why. He whispers because he's close. He whispers because he is God with us. He whispers because he is Emmanuel. The devil shouts his lies, but God often whispers his truth. Why does he whisper? Because he's close, because he's near. And why does he whisper? So that you will lean in. So that you will turn your ear to hear what he says. God doesn't shout to get our attention. He whispers to draw us near, to draw us closer. And in those moments, if we're in the wilderness experience, we're walking through challenges, we're walking through struggles in our life, What does God want to communicate to us in that gentle whisper? He wants to say things like this. I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. I will never turn my back on you. I have been with you every single moment of your life. I have been faithful to you. Even when you were not faithful to me. My love for you is overwhelming. My love for you will always pursue you. My love for you will never stop. It will never give up. And there is nothing you can do to make me love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make me love you less. He says this. When you hurt, I hurt with you. When you struggle, I struggle with you. When you go through the valley, you go through the wilderness, guess what? I am with you every step of the way. This is our God. This is our God whose name is Emmanuel, God with us, especially in the wilderness. So if you're hurting today, if you find yourself brokenhearted today, let me tell you where God is. Look at this verse up on the screen, Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Why does he whisper? Because he is near. Because he is right there with us, and because he's drawing us in. I love what David said about God's presence. He said this in Psalm 139. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, guess where you are? You're right there. If I make my bed in the depths, where are you, God? You're right there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there 
your hand will guide me. Even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. I'm going to invite the worship team up as we get ready to close. But here's what I hope that you'll understand today. Here's what I want you to know from the bottom of my heart today. That yes, we do go through valleys. Yes, we do experience wilderness seasons. But God is with us. God is not just with us, but he is with you. Every single one of you, God is with you. And when we're wandering around, maybe we're going in circles. Maybe we're wondering, God, what are you doing with me? Where are you? When you're wondering and you feel like nobody understands, I want you to know he understands. When you feel like nobody's around, I want you to know that he's around. When you feel like nobody cares, I want you to know today that he cares. And that he is always for you. He is always good.